In April, Judge Older assigned a trial date of June 15th, while the prosecution continued to conduct interviews in advance of testimony. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Office questioned Ella Jo Bailey on May 15th about Hanman. She admitted that she suggested Gary as a revenue source only because she thought she overheard someone mention an inheritance. She repeated the statements made by Bobby and Bruce following their return from Hinman's and about helping Mary wipe down Gary's stolen car. She agreed to testify when Manson went to trial. At a later grand jury, Charlie, Sadie, Bruce, and Mary were indicted for Gary's murder. Whiteley and Gunther were thrilled that Mary admitted to lying and filing a false affidavit. That meant her immunity deal was toast and she could be prosecuted. Mary was rearrested on Hinman's murder that summer, but released on writ of habeas corpus. She was never tried for her role in the Hinman slaying, and after Bobby's sentencing, she returned to the family. Her allegiance was to Charlie. She left her son with her folks in Wisconsin. On May 25th, during a visit to the evidence room at LAPD, Buliosi was shocked to find a door from Spawn Ranch, confiscated months before. The words, Helter Skelter is coming down, was written on it. This gave him physical evidence of Charlie's race war, later written in the LaBianca's blood. On June 9th, Manson, Susan, Patricia, and Leslie were called before the court for a pre-trial hearing. Charlie dramatically turned his chair away from the judge, claiming that since the court didn't respect him, that he had no respect for the court. The following day, Susan, Pat, and Leslie stood and turned their backs on the judge like little puppets. The trial established its precedent early. The women would do exactly as Charlie commanded them. Manson's new attorney, Ronald Hughes, had little experience in criminal court. He also had never won a case, but was well-versed in the counterculture. In fact, he used to be a rock band manager. Manson agreed to be represented by him, but once he saw that Hughes was not swayed by his manipulations, Charlie cut him loose. He asked to replace Hughes with Irving Canary. The judge agreed, and another volatile element was brought into play, the argumentative, even bombastic style of Canary. Pat and Leslie also attempted to have their attorneys, Paul Fitzgerald and Ira Reiner, respectively, dismissed. Both motions were denied. In early June, Buliosi visited Diane Lake at Patton Hospital. After a voluntary commitment at the psychiatric hospital, she'd recovered enough to testify. Her own parents were still of little support. In the handwritten Patton State Hospital nursing notes, the attendant jotted that Lake wants very much to go straight, stated that she had been fucked to death and that she was afraid of the Manson family doing away with her wishes she had some place to go to where she could live another way. Buliopsi also spoke several times to Barbara Hoyt. She was waffling. Several of the women had visited her and made threats toward Barbara's family. On June 15th, the jury was selected. It consisted of one Latino, a two-bit actor who later wrote a terrible book about the trial, and 11 Caucasians. Today, you likely couldn't get away with such a white jury, but in the late 60s, diversity wasn't a judicial priority. Buliopsi remembered the day that his most famous trial began. As the first panel of 60 prospective jurors was escorted into the crowded courtroom, their expressions changed from boredom to curiosity. Then, as eyes alighted on the defendants, mouths dropped open in abrupt shock. One man gasped, loud enough for those around him to hear, My God, it's the Manson trial. The prosecutor was fascinated by the man at the center of his case. During the recess, I slid my chair over next to his and asked, What are you trembling about, Charlie? Are you afraid of me? Buliosi, he said, You think I'm bad, and I'm not. I don't think you're all bad, Charlie. For instance... I understand you love animals. And you know I wouldn't hurt anyone, he said. Hitler loved animals too, Charlie. He had a dog named Blondie, and from what I've read, Adolf was very kind to Blondie. Usually, 
A prosecutor and a defendant won't exchange two words during an entire trial. But Manson was no ordinary defendant, and he loved to rap. Manson asked me why I thought he was behind these murders. Because both Linda and Sadie told me you were, I replied. Now, Sadie doesn't like me, Charlie, and she thinks you're Jesus Christ. So why would she tell me this if it wasn't true? Sadie's just a stupid little bitch, Manson said. You know, I only made love to her two or three times. After she had her baby and lost her shape, I couldn't have cared less about her. That's why she told that story, to get attention. I would never personally harm anyone. Don't give me that crap, Charlie, because I won't buy it. What about lots of Papa? You put a bullet in his stomach. Well, yeah, I shot that guy, Manson admitted. He was going to come up to Spawn Ranch and get all of us. That was kind of in self-defense. The trial began with the prosecutor's opening statement. We, therefore, intend to offer evidence at this trial showing that Charles Manson was, in fact, the dictatorial leader of the family, that everyone in the family was slavishly obedient to him, that he always had the other members of the family do his bidding for him, and that eventually they committed the seven Tate-LaBianca murders at his command. This evidence of Mr. Manson's total domination over the family will be offered as circumstantial evidence that on the two nights in question, it was he who ordered these seven murders. On July 14th, the prosecution and defense attested the selected jury. On the 21st, alternates were sworn in. This was to be a nine-month sequestration for the jury. There were affairs, heart attacks, and other dramatic events in the lives of these jurors during this trial. Meanwhile, on July 17th, Leslie dismissed Ira Reiner and was approved to have Ronald Hughes replace him. Manson liked the hippie attorney. He just wasn't good enough for him. On July 24th, people v. Charles Manson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten began in Los Angeles Superior Court. Manson began the first day of trial with an act of self-mutilation. According to Bugliosi, when Manson walked into the courtroom the first morning, people gasped. The night before, he'd gotten a hold of some sharp object and carved a bloody X into his forehead. Outside the Hall of Justice, Family members passed out his statement. I have exed myself from your world. Your courtroom is man's game. Love is my judge. He got the idea from his cellmates, two black prisoners, one a black Muslim. They apparently suggested that Manson slash an X, and therefore when the Holocaust came and Muslims took over the world, Muslims would spare the marked people. The following day, Pat, Leslie, and Sadie also carved X's into their foreheads using a heated bobby pin. Bugliosi understood that the burden of proof was on his evidence, including witnesses like Linda Kasabian. But he also knew that the prosecution does not have the burden of proving motive, I told the jury. We needn't introduce one single solitary speck of evidence as to motive. However, when we have evidence of motive, we introduce it, because if one has a motive for committing a murder, this is circumstantial evidence that it was he who committed the murder. In this trial, we will offer evidence of Charles Manson's motives for ordering these seven murders. You've got to realize that Manson was the main focus of the trial, Bugliosi later explained. The problem was that he did not physically participate in the murders. How did I connect him to the crime? I brought him in by way of circumstantial evidence. The first piece was his total complete domination. The other one is that only he had a motive for these murders, Halter Skelter. I told the jury that when those words were found printed in blood at the La Bianca murder scene, it was tantamount to finding Manson's fingerprints. Witnesses helped the jurors understand Manson's frame of mind. The Golden Penetrators had a particularly crucial role to play. Greg Jacobson would do most of the heavy lifting when it came to explaining how Manson had come to be such a central part of the Los Angeles music scene. This was the first move in depreciating Manson's cultural assets. 
much of Bugliosi's courtroom portrait of Manson would rely on a complicated map. The prosecutor needed to present the leader of his family as totally in control of his small kingdom, but off the rails with respect to understanding his place in the wider culture. Mildly delusional, but not totally insane. Bugliosi used Manson's attempts to break into the music business to help establish that Manson was operating from organized, if deeply daft motivations. Also important was that the family as a unit needed to be constructed as an anthropological curiosity, certainly worth paying attention to, and perhaps even worth recording, but not to be mistaken for peers or potential colleagues. The public clamored for details, and media filled the courtroom throughout the entire length of the trial. Sharon Tate's father attended, and the families of Stephen Parrott and the LaBiancas were also present. But the Manson family, other than those subpoenaed as witnesses, were not permitted in the courtroom. As protest, family women parked themselves on the sidewalk in front of L.A. Superior Court. There, barefoot, they sat and spread Charlie's message of protest. Later, they staged a sidewalk crawl on hands and knees, a sad and cringeworthy attempt at revolutionary theater. Some passers-by were entranced by the women's dedication, but most were simply gawkers who couldn't look away. For them, the young women of the family became emblematic of all of the lost souls of that era. It was easy to rebuff them on the street, laugh at their antics, and then go home and count their own safe, sane daughters with a sigh of relief. The women on the sidewalk had also carved X's into their foreheads in mimicry of Manson. Jeffrey Melnick wrote that the young women, who collectively became known as the Manson girls, were not going to be stitched into available American tales of heroic runaways. It would, of course, be much simpler to imagine them as the ruined daughters of the captivity narrative, the powerful story that so often included more than a hint that even after their kidnap and rape, these young white women come to feel Indian and want to stay with their new daddies. Or at least, they might come to appear Indian enough to white eyes that they could never be assimilated back into the dominant culture. Perhaps if the Manson girls had been able or willing to act out a public renunciation of Manson's power over them, the father injury might have been minimalized. But their ritual scarification in the early days of the trial, their witchy behavior on the streets outside the Hall of Justice, and their steady stream of press releases and other publicity efforts made it clear that these young women were not going to be renouncing the commitment they had made to the head of their family. The scar is central here. We recall the moment in John Ford's The Searchers when John Wayne's Ethan Edwards finally meets the Indian chief responsible for his niece's kidnap and rape. I see why they call you Scar, he mordantly observes. While no Scar is visible on the captive daughter, viewers understand what Ford is up to here. There will be no washing away of the stain that has been left on the young white woman. Kitty had joined her sisters in protest. The prodigal daughter returned. Bugliosi had hoped to use her as a witness, but she had run away from home and returned to Spawn Ranch several times. Even the family kept her at arm's length, viewing her as weak and untrustworthy, although happy to include her in their sidewalk shenanigans. She was seen crawling on her hands and knees with the others, the X prominently displayed on her forehead. She was doing what she could to prove herself, leaving baby Jeannie in the care of her mother. In July, Steve Grogan pled guilty to Grand Theft Auto and was released on probation. He returned to Spawn Ranch. On the third day of trial, Linda Kasabian was led into court. She would spend 18 long days on the stand. Linda knew on the night of the murders that she'd be the one who'd have to tell the world what happened, recalled Bugliosi. She was an ideal witness. She'd been present both nights, but she hadn't participated. She said Manson gave the orders to kill everyone at Tate. She described watching Tex Watson stab Wojtek Frykowski. 
She said Manson directed them to the LaBianca house. As she talked about what happened, you'd see these expressions of terrible pain on her face. She was cut out of different cloth than the other family members. The others were bloodthirsty robots. Susan was bitter that she had not been protected by the prosecution, but she concurred. Linda did what she should have done. She had a lot of advantages that I did not. Her daughter was now in the hands of her family on the East Coast. She was being held incommunicado. No one was allowed to see her. During her testimony, Linda endured the verbal assaults from Charlie and his attorney. As Linda's attorney, Gary Fleischman, explained, Manson picked the worst lawyer he could have gotten, Irving Kanarik, who was famous around town as an obstructionist. If I'd been cross-examining Linda Kasabian, I'd have shoved that immunity agreement up her nose. Then I'd have gotten her off the stand. But Kanarik kept her up there. He'd ask Linda, How many times have you taken LSD? She'd say, Fifty. He'd ask, Do you remember the first time? She'd say, Yes. He'd ask, Do you remember the last time? She'd say, Yes. Then he'd ask, Do you remember the thirty-seventh time? Vince would yell, Objection and there'd be a dozen lawyers at the bench. Manson sought him out for that reason, to foul up the trial. But it didn't work. Linda's testimony stood up. There are many who feel Linda should have been convicted of being an accessory at the very least. She herself said, I felt guilty. I felt as though I carried the guilt that nobody else had guilt for. There are things she might have done to mitigate what was happening the nights of the murders, but there was no clear resolution to the problem she found herself in. They say that none of us should be judged based upon what we did in one moment, or even on the worst day of our lives. But how about 18 days? Linda Kasabian was present for the murder of five human beings, but a year later, she spent nearly three harrowing weeks on the stand, bearing witness so that the killers could be convicted. She spoke truthfully, She spoke tearfully. She showed remorse while the accused killers laughed and sang in court. The fact that she stood up to 18 days of questioning by Kanarik and the other defense attorneys laid bare the unsavory details of her life and did not break is testament to her honesty. She was technically guilty of not seeking help, but she clearly did not plan the murders and did not condone them. Linda knew that Bobby had been arrested for the killing of Hinman since she took Bobby's call from jail. She might even have participated in a discussion about copycat killings to free brother Bobby, but there is zero evidence that Linda led that discussion or even knew that Bobby was guilty. She didn't fight extradition like Tex or Pat Krenwinkel. She didn't try to shock the jurors as Susan had during the grand jury. She never sold her story or tried to capitalize on her notoriety. Although, the garnishment by Frykowski's son may have been a factor, Linda was later held civilly liable along with the killers. She went before the jury and the defendants months after delivering a baby, believing that the truth would allow her to live in this world and raise her children without hopelessness. I believe that Linda was truly seeking a transcendent experience as a young woman. There was little she was unwilling to try until it came to murder. Fun games, LSD, orgies, and creepy crawlies were okay, a part of her extended adolescence. The night she witnessed five people murdered, her youth ended. Linda Kasabian wasn't a hero, just a human being who did what she could after the fact. It wasn't enough. She said so herself. Linda paid a price for the five or six weeks she spent with the Manson family. She spent her life living in fear, and yes, she had problems with addiction and the law, as have her children. In 2009, she told CNN's Larry King, I went through a lot of drugs and alcohol and self-destruction. I probably could have used some psychiatric counseling and help 40 years ago and never received it. The prosecution lost a key witness on August 4th when Randy Starr died of meningitis. His testimony would have placed a murder weapon, the bunt line, in Manson's hands. Starr had also testified during the grand jury about the cutlass sword used to slash him in. According to Randy, 
Mansum told him that he had cut a guy's ear off with that sword. Starr planned to speak on the stand about witnessing Terry Melcher's visit to Spawn Ranch in June 1969. Bugliosi now knew about Bernard Crow, who was shot with that same .22 revolver, and lots of Papa then took the stand. Crow's testimony not only put the key murder weapon from the Cielo Drive personally in Manson's hands, it also showed that Charlie was capable of murder. In August, Diane was released from Patton State Hospital. She was remanded into the custody of her guardian, Jack Gardner, and his family. That summer, filmmaker Robert Hendrickson was at Spawn Ranch filming a documentary. Initially, Paul Watkins was eager to participate in Manson, but he uncovered hidden motives. He told Ed Saunders, I wanted to make a movie about how the family really was, how the family really is, what was really going on, and then when Gypsy grabbed hold of the reins, she's got Hendrickson by the nuts, she's playing her little game, so I said there's no way it's going to come out. Gypsy's going to have the movie be the way she wants the world to see the family. But Watkins also had ulterior motives. He and Brooks Poston scored the movie. On September 4th, Charlene Caffritz died of an overdose of Namitol. Charlene was the socialite who befriended Manson the previous year. Her money couldn't save her from her own demons. Allegedly, she called Spawn Ranch three weeks before her death and spoke to Gypsy, promising to give the family money to help with their legal defense. On September 5th, Barbara Hoyt flew to Hawaii with Ruth Ann Morehouse. The family had continued to hound Barbara, insinuating that her folks could be in jeopardy if she testified against Charlie, and that she'd be happier if she were back with them. I was getting death threats, Hoyt recalled. Sometimes I knew who was calling. It was Squeaky or Sandy. The prosecution had to give my depositions to the defense, so they knew what I was going to say, and they knew it wasn't going to be good for Charlie. I stayed in touch with a few of them, trying to make them think I was still on their side. According to Saunders, Clem drove Barbara and Awish to one of the family hideouts, a house in North Hollywood which was being rented by one of the newer family members, Dennis Rice. Rice took the pair to the airport, bought them tickets, and gave them $50 in cash plus some credit cards. Using assumed names, the two girls flew to Honolulu, where they booked the penthouse suite at the Hilton Hawaiian Village Hotel. Barbara saw little of the islands, however, since Awish, sure the police would be looking for Barbara, insisted they remain in the suite. At approximately the same time each morning, Awish made a long-distance call. The number was that of a payphone, three blocks from the Rice residence. At least one of these calls was to Squeaky. Just after the call on the 9th, Awish's manner suddenly changed. She became very serious and looked at me kind of strangely, Barbara said. Awish told Barbara that she had to go back to California, but that Barbara was to remain in Hawaii. She called and made a reservation on the 115 flight to Los Angeles that afternoon. They caught a cab to the airport, arriving just before noon. Awish said she wasn't hungry, but suggested that Barbara eat something. They went to a restaurant and Barbara ordered a hamburger. When it arrived, Awish took it and went outside, telling Barbara to pay the check. There was a line at the cash register, and for several minutes, Barbara lost sight of Awish. When she came out, Awish gave her the hamburger, and Barbara ate it while they were waiting for Awish's flight. Just before she was to board, Awish remarked, Imagine what it would be like if that hamburger had ten tabs of acid in it. Barbara's response was, Wow, she had never heard of anyone taking more than one tab of LSD. After Ruth Ann departed, Barbara then went into the city. All of a sudden, I was feeling really weird, very high, and I realized there were ten tabs of acid in the hamburger. I got to a bathroom and made myself throw up. I don't know how I did it, but I got to the steps of the Salvation Army building. A man asked me, are you all right? I said no. I told him to call Mr. Bugliosi. He took me to a hospital and gave me Valium by IV to bring me down. That's when I lost consciousness. Even though they tried to kill me, I had to testify. I'd seen Sharon Tate's mother on TV talking about her grief. That's what swayed me. 
what it finally came down to for me was this. Did I want to be able to live with myself when I got old? I decided that I did. Barbara was flown home a few days later and became one of the most willing witnesses against the killers. The attempt to silence her actually turned her into a staunch opponent against the family for the rest of her life. Dennis Rice, a self-described anarchist, saw footage of Manson on the news and was intrigued. He said that he thought that the Tate-LaBianca murders might set off a revolution in America. He visited Charlie in jail and then moved himself and his four young children to Spawn Ranch. On September 11th, Danny DiCarlo took the stand and began his testimony. And that day, Charles Tex Watson lost his fight against extradition and was flown to Los Angeles. His trial would follow that of Manson and the women. Immediately upon landing in California, Tex refused to eat. He claimed that the guards beat him for his hunger strike, but he kept at it. On September 18th, Tex was brought into court. Watson had finally been returned to California after U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black refused to grant him a further stay of extradition. Sergeants Sartucci and Gutierrez, who accompanied Watson on the flight, said he spoke little, mostly staring vacantly into space. He had lost about 30 pounds during his confinement, most of it during the last two months, when it became obvious his return to Los Angeles was imminent. Fitzgerald had asked that Watson be brought into court to see if DiCarlo could identify him. Tex continued his hunger strike, dwindling to 110 pounds. Someone intervened, and he was force-fed by tube. On September 26th, a fire destroyed Spawn Ranch. It killed many of the horses and animals. George was devastated. He fought to keep that land, to keep what he could, only to lose it all. After the fire, he moved to Klamath, Oregon. Charlie, Leslie, Pat, and Susan continued their antics in court. Manson did everything he could to keep the trial in the circus-like atmosphere that he believed might result in a hung jury, at least for him. Judge Older was constantly reprimanding Charlie and the women. Bugliosi remembered the day that Manson snapped back. Manson got a hold of a sharp pencil and from a standing position jumped over the defense table toward the judge, shouting, In the name of Christian justice, someone should cut your head off. It was an amazing feat. I don't know how he did it. The deputies immediately tackled him and dragged him off. From there on out, Judge Older wore a handgun under his robe. Manson was ejected from court that day, and again a week later. Susan, Pat, and Leslie were encouraged to misbehave. Charlie expected that they would take the fall, and he would get off scot-free. The women were fucked. Susan remembered, By this time in the trial, I no longer even had my conscientious attorney, Richard Caballero, to turn to. I've had him replaced, and Manson's order was day shin. Both of my co-defendants had replaced their lawyers with one of Charles Manson's lawyers as well. At this point in the trial, and faced with Manson's request, there was nowhere at all to turn. 